Okay, so this is Building Consumer Social Apps. My name is James. That's my personal website. That's my email if you want to contact me. Uh, so today, evident by the title, we're talking about building consumer social apps. So the first question I have for you is, why do you want to do that? Uh, and you maybe are asking yourself, why is he asking why? I'll tell you why. Uh, they don't really make money. They are a lot of effort and a lot of time that goes into them. It's very difficult to make. They almost never end up working out, and you are far better off building apps that are painkillers instead of vitamins. What do I mean by that? If you go and approach a business or something like that, they have a legitimate problem that you can solve and make money for, and they will hand you a check for $10,000 to fix it. Every client you get will be $10,000. Consumer, they don't need social apps. That's not something anybody really needs, and you can argue that the market is kind of saturated already. So you're creating vitamins. You're creating supplements that maybe people will use, maybe they won't. And uh, quite frankly, that doesn't really make any money. Um, so why? Why are you wanting to do this to yourself? If you're anything like me, you probably watched this movie, The Social Network. And uh, for me, this was the bug. This is what got me wanting to make consumer social apps be just like Mark Zuckerberg and uh, build something that a lot of people use. Now, this movie is, has a lot of dramatics. It's fictional uh, in a lot of ways. So it doesn't really paint a clear picture of what Facebook was. So let's look at the stats of Facebook and let's actually talk about numbers here. So within the first 24 hours of it launching in February of 2004, it had 650 users signed up. Now, 650 users in 24 hours doesn't sound like a big deal to us today. But you have to remember in 2004, the internet was not as prevalent as it is now. Everybody didn't have cell phones in their pockets that could connect to the internet. And computers were largely used as word processing uh, computers or st stuff used for business or for school. It wasn't, the internet wasn't exactly a destination like it is now. So 650 users in 24 hours is actually a very big deal, especially back then. Uh, within two weeks of it launching, it grew to about 4,300 users, which once again, in a time when the internet was not really a big deal. To make it even larger and to really, really drive it home, by March, which is just one month after it launched, it had its 10,000th user on the platform after it expanded to include Columbia, Stanford, and Yale. It closed out 2004, its launching year, with one million users. And one year later, it closed with six million users. That is explosive growth, especially for a time when the internet, like I said, was not something everybody was on and everybody was using, everybody had access to. This was obviously a very big deal. And if you're wondering how that continued to look, this is the graph of Facebook popularity over the course of a bunch of years basically the first 10 years of its life. Uh, you can see it starts off small, 2004, 2005, 2006, like we talked about, very quickly becomes a mountain. This is a once in a lifetime phenomenon that only happens at the right time with the right app and uh, the right users. It's not really something that gets replicated that often, especially nowadays. So why? Why did that happen? Why was that mountain possible back then? Well. What indicates success? We'll talk about sort of some of the key indicators of that. First is rapid growth. Uh, over half the undergraduate population of Harvard was on Facebook within its first month of being released. So you can already tell that this app, when it came out, this, this website, it was a very, very big deal to people on, on the Harvard campus. It expanded very well. Once other universities like Columbia, Stanford, and Yale got access to it, it spread like absolute wildfire over there. Facebook was also a destination. And this is an important point that gives us a little bit of an indication of why it was so explosive back then. Uh, it was some people's only destination on the internet. So they would go on to their computer and visit Facebook and be on Facebook. And that was it. They wouldn't switch between apps. They wouldn't go on different websites. This is what they did, and that's it. That doesn't really happen anymore today. We have a bunch of different apps. People, their attention is spread across uh, different platforms. 
And that makes it a little more difficult to capture attention. Facebook was able to do that. And on top of that, it stood out. It emphasized real identities while competitors focused on usernames. Facebook was not the first social network on the internet. MySpace and Friendster was there first. The difference is, is that Friendster and MySpace used usernames and they allowed people to have pseudonyms. And pseudonyms are good, especially on the internet, but having the emphasis on real names was something novel and something new to the internet and Facebook really capitalized on that. So basically all those points boil down to high growth rate, high demand, high engagement, and novel features. So now let's talk about social apps as a whole and what are some metrics that are important to social apps that we create today. User growth rate. So first off, you want your growth rate to be like wildfire, especially when everyone is glued to their phone and computer nowadays. We all have it in our pockets. There's no reason why your growth rate shouldn't be explosive. Everybody has access to the internet, can go on the app store and download what you create. Uh, this wildfire and this growth rate stems from the network effect, which we'll get into a little bit later, but the network effect is basically the whole idea of when a user joins your app, they bring other people with them to the app, either through word of mouth, invitations, or some other technology that you include inside of the app. Uh, so nowadays, your growth rate, you're kind of aiming to have each new user bring in five additional people with them. That's very difficult to do, and we'll talk about why it's difficult in certain age groups uh, a little bit later. There's also user demand. Uh, user demand should be noticeably high, especially after you launch. So there should be a lot of emails being sent to you, people asking if they can have the app in their school, their university, or their community. Uh, direct messages to a brand account that you have on uh, Twitter, X, uh, Instagram, or something like that. Tweets directed at you, uh, things like that. It should be noticeable that people actually want to use what you've made. You should have organic social media popularity, not paid for. And this is very important, because I think a lot of people get this conflated and confused. They look at success of apps and they see the popularity and the vi virality of an app on something like TikTok. Um, that tends to be organic. Some of it is paid for user generated content, but the apps that do that don't last. If you really want a lasting app, you need to have a reason for people to talk about it. And if there's a reason for people to talk about it, they will talk about it. That should be your goal then, to have a reason for people to talk about your app and foster organic social media popularity. And extending from that, of course, people should be talking about your app to your friends. Uh, and that stems from having novel features, having something to talk about, some reason to share what you've made. There's user engagement. So user engagement should be very, very high for apps today. Uh, and honestly, once it slips, this is kind of the first indicator that your app is beginning to fall off or, or fail a little bit. Um, it's one of these things, user engagement is a complicated thing. It's a little bit like a chicken and egg. Um, but the best way to put it is really, if your app feels empty and boring, it will be empty and boring. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy. In order for people to want to post content to your app, there has to be content there that they can make an example of and say, okay, this is the kind of content that exists on this platform. This is what I should be creating as well. Um, so it's very important that you have user engagement very, very high. User retention is another important one. Uh, user retention is how long somebody actually spends on the app that you created. This needs to be very high, especially in the beginning. If you are not able to hold your user's attention in the first couple of days of your app launching, how are you gonna fare a month from now, right? It's a big question and you have to make sure that you have solid answers for it and you have metrics that line up to prove what you believe to be a, a reason to be on the app and a reason to have users eyeballs uh, looking at your content or whatever you're serving in your app. Friend network. Friend networks are very important and I think often misunderstood. Um, all of us as humans, we are creatures of tribalism. Uh, we want to be with other people. We want to be in small cliques and communities. We do not want to stand out. We want to fit in with the crowd. 
So if you maximize the amount of friends that a user has on an app, they're more likely to stay. It gets a little bit stickier and a little bit harder for them to leave, which means that the incentive is to grow your friend network on your app. Now, daily monthly active users, this is a number that you're gonna see thrown around a lot, especially if you're pitching your app and they wanna know how it's performing or something like that. Um, these are important too, but in all honesty, I think daily and monthly active users is more a, um, it's more a number that is a result of all the other metrics that I talked about. So if your daily retention is failing or your user engagement is not really there, then your daily and monthly active users, you're gonna see a hit in that. So I think it's kind of a lagging um, heuristic as to the success of your app. You should really be focusing on those other points that I made. So the next important thing when you're making an app is you have to understand the audience that you're pitching for. Uh, and this is incredibly, incredibly important. So first we have to understand why do people download apps? What is the reason why somebody is going to go to the app store, type in the name of your app and click download? There's basically three golden reasons. Uh, the first is to find a partner or love interest. There's a lot of apps like this, some more obvious than others. Obviously, Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, other dating apps. Very obvious that you're there to find a love interest. But there's some other hidden ones as well, like something like Instagram. Building your persona online and having content and pictures and showing who you are as a person is in a way uh, developing this like social profile that you can use to find a partner or love interest. And there's many apps that follow that same pattern. Uh, the other one is to make or save money. So this one is kind of obvious. There's a lot of like apps you can download to save some money, save some time, which is a result of, uh, or results in money. Um, so this is really important. It doesn't really fit into consumer social though. Um, so this is not really something that we focus on. Uh, and then the last one is to forget the world exists. And this one is a little dramatic sounding, but it's basically YouTube or Netflix or TikTok. It's something where there's a lot of consumption and the user consumes to basically forget about the world and just pay close attention to that one thing that they're looking at. Uh, be it a timeline of videos, a singular video, a TV show, a movie, something like that. So the next thing is understanding uh, basically age groups. And I'm gonna start this off with maybe a little bit of a provocative title, but adults are terrible. And it's just a fact, adults really are. Uh, they're specifically terrible for consumer social apps because their friend groups are distant, uh, which means that they don't really talk to each other and there's not really an opportunity for them to say, hey man, uh, there's this really cool app I downloaded, you should get it too. They don't really do that. They don't really talk to their friends anymore. Everyone's distant. So there's really, you lose out on that like ability to have word of mouth contributing to your network effect. Uh, and the last point is that they have, they're creatures of habit. We all are, but once you reach about the age of 25, you become less willing to try new things, uh, be adventurous, and you kind of already have your habits set. And it's true of them. Uh, they have the apps that they use consistently, and they're very unlikely to change that, especially for you. And you actually see this effect happen if you look at the age group of people on Facebook versus Instagram versus TikTok. You can see there are generations of people that just stay in that and kind of move up in age forever with that app. Um, so you really, really should not be targeting adults. And of course, that means younger audiences is who you want to be after. Uh, so younger audiences are amazing for consumer social apps. They're more willing to try things. They're more susceptible to psychological tricks that you can embed inside of your app. They have more time to spare. They don't want to be left out because of tribalism. And they talk to their friends all the time. Their friends are their entire life. You now understand their motivation for majority of their actions. And you can exploit that using psychological tricks. So now that we know uh, the difference between adults and younger audiences, we wanna really ask ourselves who is our target audience? Because obviously it gets more specific than just age ranges. Um, so we wanna ask ourselves, who are they? What do they want? Which of the three categories do they fall into of the three golden rules? Um, why do they fall into that category? And how can you use psychology to appeal to the desires that drive them towards one of those three points? 
Uh, so you basically want to be asking yourself these questions and develop a little bit of a persona, and maybe a few. Um, now, personally, I, I don't like making these personas very rigid uh, because I think a lot of things change, especially in consumer social, uh, especially if you're not in that age group and you're targeting that age group. It, it gets a little complicated to kind of predict what somebody wants, but you should have a rough idea uh, of answers to these questions before you get started on a consumer social app or else you're kind of just building for nobody. Another important thing is geography. Uh, so I'm gonna basically just ask you a little like mind experiment. Uh, think, what if Facebook launched to the entire US at once? Uh, so obviously Facebook didn't. They launched just to Harvard and then expanded out to campuses individually afterwards. But let's imagine that they just launched in the United States of America. It would be a lot harder for a user to find and connect with friends, uh, which obviously means that the app is kind of dead on arrival, right? Because we're talking about the importance of friend networks on social apps. If somebody random in like Massachusetts or something downloads Facebook, uh, goes onto the app and tries to find their friends and none of their friends are there, your app is dead on arrival. They are not going to use that app. Uh, some less obvious things, but some of the things that really helped Mark Zuckerberg uh, in the early days of Facebook is uh, if you were to launch to the, United, to the entire United States, it's much harder to stalk your crush. Uh, and that sounds funny, but it's true. Um, because if you think about the desire, and one of the reasons why people download these apps is to find a love interest, you lose that entire piece, right? Like there's an entire... Uh, motivation to download and use your app that is gone if they can't find their crush online. Um, and it's much harder to brag to your Facebook friends about how great your life is if you have no friends on Facebook, right? It doesn't really end up working out and you end up losing out. It's also in the pursuit of finding a love interest. So you are completely missing this kind of psychological trick that you can kind of use to your advantage. So. There's something that I like to call the Facebook formula, but Facebook was not the ones that invented this. It's been around for a lot longer than them. Um, but basically what Facebook did was they launched in tight communities, university campuses. And these communities were places where people already talked to each other. So there was word of mouth. There was a kind of a reason that they were all there together, right? They were all in school. They were all in chemistry. They were all in physics, whatever. They were all together. Um, and they could recognize people's profiles on Facebook as people that they've seen walking in the hall, in their chemistry class, and that plays a big role in the success of an app. And the reason that is, is because our brain is funny. If we go and we look at a picture, like let's say you go on Instagram, and you look at a picture and you look at a name of somebody that you don't know that commented on some post on an account that you follow, that person could be a bot for all you know, right? Like, they are not a real person to you. You've never spoken to them. And our brain kind of thinks of them like that, as like a, it, it kind of an ambiguous entity that we don't really understand. But if you go on to Instagram or Facebook and you see uh, somebody's face that you know from chemistry and their name, there's something in your brain that kind of just clicks and goes, oh, I know that person. And that click is something that you can capitalize on and should capitalize on. Facebook did, and it worked out in their favor. So um, it's very important that we saturate markets, and that is exactly what Facebook did in the case of tight-knit communities like university campuses. So this is kind of the formula for that. Uh, you want to find a small market. In the case of Facebook, it was universities, uh, university campuses, but it could be anything. It doesn't have to be that, and uh, especially nowadays, it doesn't have to be a physical location. It could be online community, some forum online, maybe a, a Reddit, a subreddit or something. Um, the next step is to saturate it. So if it's a smaller community, and let's say it's maybe 5,000 people, like Harvard campus uh, was about that back then, it's really easy to saturate it, right? Because if you get 4,000 people on there, that's 80% of all the people on campus using your app, and now they're talking about it, word of mouth spreads, and the friend network is there. After you've saturated it, you want to expand out. And this is what Facebook did when they went to Columbia, Stanford, Yale, et cetera. Uh, you want to do the same. You want to expand out of that small market because you don't want to stay small forever. Uh, but you have to make sure that you do it at the right time and a time when 
it makes sense. Like you've saturated everything, and the next market that you're targeting maybe is slightly larger and can be saturated as well. That's very important. And then obviously after that, you've got to keep going. You repeat, 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 and eventually you get big enough that you can launch to the entire United States, same way Facebook did. Uh, so basically, the, what I'm telling you here is to copy the greats. Uh, so find a community, physical or an online collective of some sort, uh, physical as in like everyone on a university campus or a collective, people that like uh, techno music or something like that. Find a community of people, and uh, the easier it is to meaningfully saturate that community, the better it is for you as an app founder. So just a couple examples. Facebook launched to universities. MySpace launched to music communities. Gas, TBH, which are two uh, polling apps, um, they launched to high schools, and PayPal launched to sellers on eBay. So these were all consumer apps. Obviously, most of them were consumer social, but PayPal, I threw that in there just to show you that this is really a formula that works with consumer apps in general. It doesn't have to just be social. So let's talk about creating the idea. So creating the idea for your app and what goes into that. So first you have to ask yourself, what is the app type? Is it messaging dominant? Is it posting dominant? Uh, consumption dominant? Is it some other type? So messaging would be like Snapchat. Uh, posting would be like Instagram. And consumption would be something like TikTok um, or YouTube. Uh, or is it some other kind of novel idea that you have? Um, so it's very important that you understand what the app type is because it contributes to everything else down the line. So you have to think about why are they downloading the app? Who is downloading the app? And then what uh, type of app best suits that purpose? How involved do you want the user to be? Uh, do they need to produce content in order for the app to work? Uh, so if they go onto the app, like if it's a consumption app like TikTok, if you went on there and there was no TikToks for you to watch, there's nothing to consume, uh, which means that that's not really going to work, right? So do they have to produce content in order for the app to work? Uh, if they're mostly consuming it, where's that content coming from? Are they responding to their friends like on Snapchat where you're able to send a message and receive a message? Uh, are they having to do some repeated action consistently? Something like, uh, like Tinder, like swiping or TikTok swiping upwards. These are very consistent actions. Uh, another good example is Be Real, uh, where they send you a notification at a random time during the day and you have to take a photo using your front and back camera. Uh, so these are consistent actions that are taken um, that basically tell you how involved the user has to be. So then you have to ask yourself, what is the medium of the app that you're creating? Is it short, sh short form video like TikTok? Long form video like YouTube? Uh, is it pictures like Instagram? Text like Twitter slash X? Uh, polls like TVH and Gas? Is it pokes like early Facebook? Is it messaging like Snapchat? You have to ask yourself, what is the medium and what is the medium that best represents and um, basically best connects the user to their end goal and their end motivation with downloading your app? Then we have to ask yourself, where can we use psychology? And psychology, uh, I think it kind of gets a bad rap in terms of making consumer social apps. I think there's a little bit of a stigma that you really shouldn't play into psychology. Um, but I think psychology is a very important tool and you can leverage it for good. You don't have to be manipulative and bad when you're making these apps. Um, you can help people feel good about themselves using psychology and also make money on your app at the same time. Uh, there's many cases of that happening with like Gas and TBH uh, where it was anonymous polls and people started feeling really good about themselves because they never knew that they were so liked in school because people wouldn't say it to their face, uh, but they would have it on this app. And um, it's all through the power of psychology that that was possible. So I think we really have to understand uh, where we can use psychology in our app. So one of the biggest things that you can use, especially if they're downloading your app to find a love or partner uh, interest, is the mystery of a crush. This is very, very powerful. Uh, it keeps their mind racing. It keeps them wanting to come back and figure out uh, what happens next sort of thing. Uh, habits and consistency are also powerful triggers. So if there's a habit that you can develop, something like swiping left and right on a dating app, swiping up and down like TikTok, uh, or notification being sent out, having to click it, and then take photos of something, you basically can teach a user habits, and that habit becomes part of them. 
uh, you can ask yourself, can we show somebody how much they are liked, how important they are? These are very powerful things and makes them happy and feel good and want to come back to your app. Uh, and maybe they want to tell their friends and share it uh, on other social media platforms or just word, word of mouth. Um, can we let people live vicariously through others, develop bonds with people over the internet? This is a very big one that TikTok and YouTube do. Um, basically, you have these influencers on TikTok and YouTube that post the content about their lives, vlogs, and you feel like you know them. And in reality, you don't. Uh, but this is to the benefit of the platform because if you feel like you know them, you feel like they're a friend, you're gonna keep coming back because it expands that friend network. And when you have somebody in your friend network that is a very powerful creator and keeps uploading content for you to keep wanting to come back and seeing what they're doing, that's good for you as a platform, as a, as a social app. Can we make people feel like they're missing out by not using our app? Get back to tribalism and make people have the fear of missing out. Can we motivate people to want to get this app because they want to be with everyone else? They do not want to be different. Then you ask yourself, what is the central action of your app? So you need to find one clear action that defines and drives your entire app. You wanna make it as simple as you possibly can. So if it's something like TikTok, you just wanna swipe. If it's Tinder, you wanna swipe. Uh, if Snapchat, take a photo, send it to a friend. Gas, answer polls. These are very simple actions. They're not complicated. You keep it very simple for your users. And that singular action drives the entire app. Now we're going to get into the network effect. As promised, we're going to start talking about it. So we're going to talk about the methods of uh, building this network effect and basically contributing and building a uh, social graph. Um, so one of the biggest things you could do first, and I highly suggest that you do it, is you should sync contacts. Uh, and what syncing con contacts does on a social media app on a cell phone uh, is it basically tells you who knows who. Uh, it lets you connect people that Maybe you're not connected on your app, but you know that they have each other's phone number. You're able to connect them uh, on a social graph, and you're able to track invites. So you know this person invited this person, uh, like person A invited person B. Person B didn't respond to person A's invite, but did respond to person C's. Now all of a sudden you know who has more influence over person B. Uh, and this can be very, very powerful. Uh, external platform sharing is also a really great method. Um, this, you have to be careful, but you can make it good. Uh, you have to basically make it easy to share. So it should be like one or two clicks max. Uh, it needs to be desirable to share. And this is very, very important. It has to be something that the user organically wants to share for a reason. Uh, and obviously the best way to do this is by playing into psychology. Uh, so maybe having something that tells them how many like, likes they got or somebody called them cute, something like that. Being able to post that, it's flattering to them. They're more willing to do it, which means that there's a chance that they might post on Instagram about your app or TikTok or something. Uh, and it's very important that you don't make it an advertisement. You can maybe put your logo somewhere there, um, but if you make it an advertisement, that's lame. Nobody likes that. You should not be doing that. And then obviously you have word of mouth. Uh, word of mouth is not good. It's not bad. It, it might work, um, but it's less measurable and less reliable. Word of mouth. If you can do it through invites or something, it's a lot better because you can track. You can see when an invite is sent out, when it was responded to, and uh, go from there. You can be aggressive. Uh, so you can be aggressive. The key is not to be annoying. If you are annoying, uh, nobody is gonna want to continue using your app. So you can be aggressive and you can ask for things like syncing your contacts, and you'll be surprised how little people actually care about that. If you're an engineer like me or somebody that has built apps, um, Maybe you're a little more privacy-minded and you understand privacy a little bit better. And maybe you know, when that app asks you if you're okay with syncing contacts, you say, no, don't allow, because uh, that's weird. It's an invasion of privacy. Uh, but I'm here telling you that majority of people do not care. Uh, majority of consumers don't care. They don't even think about it. They just click allow. Uh, so take advantage of that. Be aggressive. Ask for it if it's going to help your app. Uh, they end up caring less than you think. Uh, you can entice people to invite their friends, and they will probably do it. If you entice them in a way that is flattering to the user uh, or is kind of like dangling a carrot in front of them, they're more likely to do it, obviously. But even just asking, uh, hey, do you want to share this? You'd be surprised how many people say yes. The key is you do it at a good time and you do it 
in a way that's not annoying and doesn't pop up every single time, something like that. So you have to kind of find what works, and every app is a little bit different, but you can be aggressive and actually ask for what you want, and you will probably get it. So let's talk about designing the app, and this is kind of like the philosophy and theory behind it. So first is the user experience. Uh, so this is actually how the user interacts with your app and uh, uses it to accomplish whatever goal they want. Uh, so first off, you have to know users are dumb. And maybe you don't know that. Maybe you, like, you, know, you pick out one user in a vacuum and you look at them and you say, okay, they're not that dumb. They are. They really are. They all are. And you have to, you have to, you have to know this. They are always dumber than you think. Always. So design your app to be as simple as possible. Remove any complication and replace it with simplicity. Confusion will lead to less use. Every bit of friction is another reason why they will stop using your app. So remove all the friction, make it stupid proof, and make it easy, easy, easy to use. Next, you want to make it like a casino. Now, once again, there's a little bit of a stigma like this as well, because obviously gambling is bad, and I, I agree to that. Um, but there's a lot of good qualities with casinos in terms of uh, building consumer consumables. And um, there's a reason why. They're as addictive as crack. Uh, so if you can build your app to be like that, and also garner a positive experience for the user. That is a good thing, and you should do that. Um, so you can add color, emojis, animations, other elements that kind of make it visually interesting and appealing to look at. You want to make it so that they want to keep coming back. There's a reason why they want to come there. Um, now, obviously, this changes a little bit depending on your demographic. If they're coming expecting to have like a flat, kind of minimalist look, don't, don't go into the casino thing because that's not going to work. But if you're targeting youth and it's kind of like a, a fun app that they're kind of just goofing around on, you can probably make it like a casino and find some uh, pretty great results from it. You can also gamify. And gamify is a massive thing. Lots of apps are doing it. Uh, even like Duolingo is doing it. Um, basically, gamifying is the idea of like letting users advance and earn something for their app usage. So you're giving them rewards that mean something towards their goal. And, uh, and basically helps them get to their motivations on the app. It makes them feel better about what they're trying to accomplish. With gamifying, you have to play with psychology. Uh, so hints are very powerful and will keep, coming, uh, will keep people coming back. So if you're something like an anonymous teen polling app like GAS or TBH, saying something like, somebody in grade 11 found you cute, or somebody in grade 12 uh, likes the color of your eyes, that's a lot more powerful than saying John likes the color of your eyes because somebody keeps their mind racing and they wonder who was it. And if you have an app that dynamically changes those hints, something like polls, uh, they will never really know who is who and you could have multiple somebodies and they're constantly wondering who it is and they're trying to get their next fix, figuring out who it is by coming to your app and earning uh, a hint. And maybe they earn that hint by doing that one action on your app repeatedly. You have to simplify the flow. Uh, so once they download the app, they should already feel like they are on your app. It should be that simple. They download it, they're on it. That's basically it. Uh, obviously, you can't do that. You need to sign up and a little bit of a flow, but you need to make it simple. Uh, you should lean into exclusivity. So if you are launching to just a university, lean into that. Make them feel like they're being part of an exclusive club. Make them feel good about the choice that they're making. And remove all unnecessary annoyances. Um, so this is any like, little thing on your app that might be kind of annoying to deal with, just remove it. Uh, if there's any like, complication, like it, confirming your password after you've typed it, like retyping it, just get rid of that. I, I wouldn't even bother with passwords, and we'll get into that right now. You want to leverage familiarity. So use services that they already have set up. Uh, if you know your users are on a mobile phone, like an iPhone, um, make everything revolve around that phone. It's that simple, right? Use services that they're familiar with because every point of friction is another reason why they are not going to use your app. You need payment details? Use Apple Pay. Signing up for an account? Use a one-time passcode instead of a password. Uh, and then let Apple have that little thing where it has the numbers and you click it, fills it in automatically. Leverage the device that they're on. Uh, learn the device that you're targeting in your demographic and just use every service you possibly can to make it smooth for your user. 
Anything new is another point of friction, and like I say, friction is another reason why they are not going to continue using your app. Now let's talk about user interface. So this is what they actually interact with on the app. Your user interface should be visually appealing. Uh, you want to design it like a casino, like I said. Uh, you want to make it smooth, clean, and uncluttered. You want to make it visually appealing and something they actually want to look at. So lean into tasteful uh, animations, make it snappy, and make it quick. Leverage your device once again. If you are on an iPhone, make it look like iOS. If you're on an Android, make it look like an Android. There's a kind of like a, a feeling amongst especially younger audiences that Android is sort of like a broke person's device. Uh, and I mean, you can obviously say no. You look at the prices of Androids, they're expensive. But lean into that, you know what I mean? Like, if they download an app on their iPhone and it looks like an Android, they are, you know they're going to be angry about that. So don't do it, right? Like, make it look like an iOS app. Make everything simple, clear, and concise. And if there's any confusion, if there's any, like, I don't know how to use the app, or your app is slightly complicated, have a short tutorial, have a short instruction set, uh, maybe even a guided tour that actually takes them through the process of doing that one defined action that we talked about earlier. So if it's making a post, through the guided tour, show them how to make a post and have them make a post in that guided tour. Push them to complete your one central action with all the rest of the UI. So if it's making a post, make that front and center. Make that something that they open the app and they see it and they're motivated to click it. Uh, Twitter does a really good job with this, with the little the, um, compose tweet button in the uh, bottom right corner. You want to lean into that. You want to push them to do that one central action as much as you possibly can. Now let's talk about a little philosophy in consumer social apps uh, and building them specifically. So you basically want to make everything a component. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Um, basically everything you design, be it the parts inside of the, the user interface, the architecture, the back end, the databases, everything should be a component. So you should build them independently, bring them all together at the end. This allows you to iterate easier and much faster because you can just say, okay, uh, I need to work on this specific component of the back end and only work on that back end in a vacuum, that part of the back end. Um, and it obviously makes building apps a lot faster, launching them a lot faster, and if you need to make iterative changes or repairs a lot quicker. It makes them super easy to swap out and reuse when you need as well because odds are your first app is probably not going to be the one that, that takes off. Um, so you're not always going to be using the same components that you've built across all of your apps all the time. Uh, so if you could take them out and put them in and reuse them, that makes it really, really fast to launch apps. Everything should be a subsystem. So you should basically be thinking of it like a microserver, uh, microservices architecture philosophy, but without the headache of managing a microservices architecture. Uh, so you want to be aiming for ease of maintenance and reduce the points of failure inside of your system. Uh, each of your subsystems should be able to communicate easily together uh, with some agreed upon sort of um, object, be it like, like a, a JSON format or something like that. Something that they all talk to each other with and is common between them. And you should be aiming to build it sort of like a monolithic architecture uh, that can be separated as you need. So when you launch and you have no users, you have a monolithic architecture and just one front end, one back end, one database, and maybe all your subsystems built into that uh, linear kind of model. And then when it's time to scale out, because now you have a million users all of a sudden, you can break the pieces out individually and make them services and scale them out uh, independently as you need. Uh, front end and back end independence. This is really important because I think a lot of people nowadays, they see React, they see Next.js, they see Nuxt, uh, Vercel, they see all these different frameworks, mostly JavaScript, uh, but Django is the same, Spring Boot's the same, uh, that couple the back end and the front end together. And this is good for some things, and uh, it's existed since the very beginning of the internet. This is how it's been uh, done. This, this is good for some things. If you're making small apps and you're not expecting a lot of people uh, to be using at massive scale, this is fine. Um, but generally in consumer apps, and especially ones that you're trying to have explosive growth like a social app, iterations are your friend. All-in-one frameworks are not. Uh, because now, if you have to make a change on your front end, you are also pushing changes for your back end at the same time. 
You want to have these independent and separate systems that you can work on individually because uh, that increases your flexibility to swap technologies. So if you no longer want to use React on your front end, you want to use like Angular uh, or Vue or something, you can do that without having to change your back end. Um, your platform or hosting providers, you have all the options when it's independent and you can just control them individually. Uh, and of course you can scale them independently as required without burning a lot of cash. Uh, because let's say you have to you know, serve more front ends uh, because your, your app is very front end dominant in the sense that it doesn't make a lot of back end calls, um, but there's a lot of front end actions that have to do. So you have to serve more front end uh, on like your, your CDN or something. If it's tied to the back end, as you scale up your front ends, you're also forced to scale up your back ends. And your back ends are going to be a lot more expensive to scale out than front ends. So now you're paying for something that you're not even needing to use which is obviously ridiculous, and if you're in the beginning of a company, you're just burning cash for no reason. You also want to make everything out of simple tools. Uh, industry standard frameworks and tools is your best bet. You do not want to like, be building some recommendation system or something and be ha having to like, look up how specific things work and spending a lot of time in documentation. If you can do very uh, industry standard and regular tools, uh, use them to build your products. You can just Google something, probably find a bunch of Reddit links, uh, Stack Overflow, GitHub, uh, with answers to your questions, which obviously makes everything go a lot faster. Uh, this extends, of course, to Rust and Go, uh, which are like kind of the two most popular like engineering geared languages right now. And they're great, they're very cool, uh, but making money is cooler. I think we can all agree on that. And uh, you have to ask yourself, is Rust and Go, if it can handle 10 times the amount of requests per second, let's say, uh, over something like Python. Is it worth spending 10 times the amount of time to make that? I would say no. I would say you're probably better off using Python if it's a little bit slower, can handle a little less requests. At least it's done faster and you can test and you can iterate and you can actually see if this idea is even worth it. If you even want to be a consumer social app uh, founder, right? The faster that you can iterate and the faster you can fail is basically it basically means that it's, you have a better chance of being successful in the long run. Uh, and if you're spending all your time building like a Rust and Go backend, it's just terrible. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, so basically, keep it simple, stupid. That's the best thing you could do. Just keep it simple. Pick simple languages uh, and just don't make it complicated. Uh, it's very important also to do everything in-house. And when I say everything in-house, I mean uh, do not hire outside help for your consumer social app. Uh, it just makes it very complicated. When things break, if the founders and the engineers that are working with you do not understand what they're working on, it makes everything take a lot longer and consumers have very short attention spans. So if you screw up, they might forgive you once, but they will not forgive you twice. So you need to make sure that everything is tip top shape and is tip top shape very quickly. So everyone working on the app should have a vested interest in its success, especially in the beginning. So. You know, if your app breaks at like 2 a.m. and some fix has to be applied, who is going to do that? They, everyone needs to have extreme familiarity and understanding with the code and tech stack. It is incredibly, incredibly important that that's the case. Uh, because if they get up at 2 a.m. and they don't know what they're looking at, that app is not going to be fixed and you're losing people by the minute. So ask yourself, if something needs to be fixed right now and it's 2 a.m., who is going to do it and are they capable of it? If it's in-house, you probably have the person, you could probably wake them up with a phone call and they'll get on and they'll fix it. If it's outside help, you're probably waiting the next business day. Whenever that business day starts, they're gonna take their time. They have no rush because they're getting paid for a contract. They're not getting paid on the app success. Your engineers, your founders, if they have a vested interest, they're getting rich when you are too, and that's amazing. You want to uh, basically design with uh, iterations in mind all the individual components that you make. Experiments should be easy to do and even easier to undo. Uh, there should be little to no influence between the subsystems. So if you change something in one component, it really should not affect the other one structurally or programmatically. Uh, and they should be easy to pick apart and say, uh, that didn't work, now let me fix it. So if you launch an app and this one subsystem didn't work, you should be able to pull it out, iterate on it, put it back in, and see what happens the next time. You want to be uh, leveraging native experiences as much as you possibly can. 
So you should be focusing on the devices that your demographic is most likely to use your app on. In most cases, especially younger audiences, and over here in like Canada and the United States, that's iPhone. Uh, so I'll give you a personal kind of anecdote. 74% of RUMind's users use an iPhone. RUMind was my first social app, and 74% um, of them use iPhone. That is a lot of people. Um, it's very hard to build and support both iOS and Android, so just don't. Like, it's that simple. I just wouldn't. Uh, something like React Native and uh, other right ones deployed endlessly, twice, whatever, uh, frameworks are great, and they caught me in a, a loop as well, but you miss the native feel. And when somebody is downloading an app, they want that native feel. They want to be able to see the slick animations, everything just work, and the glossy effect of an iPhone. They want that, uh, or be it Android. So really just focus on native. If it's Swift, Objective-C, Kotlin, or Java, whatever, focus on native. Um, end up, what you end up doing is focusing on the 80%, perfecting the 80%, and forget about the 20, because the 20 doesn't really matter anyway. This is very important, and this is one that I wish a lot of people told me before. Um, you should get multiple providers for any outside services that you get. So um, if you have like analytics done outside of your company, you should get multiple providers for that. And the reason for that is that providers are shark, uh, sharks. They smell success in the water, and they're going to come and rinse you for every dollar that you have. So you need to have a backup plan. And you should have a second provider ready to go. Uh, in some cases, if you can have both providers working at the same time, that's amazing. Something like analytics is a little harder because you're paying for storage in two places, and that's just wasteful. Uh, but if it's something like sending out one-time passcodes uh, over text, you can have two texting uh, service providers. And uh, when one starts gouging you, you could pit them against one another and see whoever gives you the best deal. Uh, or even if they're not gouging you, but you want to save some money, you can use it as a negotiation tactic. And uh, you are not locked into a contract. You're not locked into a singular provider. You already have a secondary person. You already have a backup plan. Uh, so this also obviously reduces single points of failure because providers do go down too. Nobody's perfect. It's software. Prepare for the worst, right? And uh, there is even worse, like if your providers are both out of the same AWS, like data center zone or region, and that goes down, then yeah, you're screwed. Um, but that doesn't really happen. So if you can kind of maximize your ability to, to have other options when things go wrong, that's ideal. Uh, this actually ties in very nicely with what I just said. Uh, you don't want to break. As your app, you don't want to break, and things are going to break because it is software. That is just the nature of software, the nature of programming. Uh, so you want to reduce the chances of it breaking as much as possible and recover whenever, whenever possible. Uh, so if there's some message that has to be sent or some event that has to be triggered and it fails, recover it as soon as you possibly can. Uh, you should hide all errors from the user unless it's absolutely, ab absolutely necessary to show them uh, because, honestly, errors make your app look sloppy, uh, especially if you're somebody in the community and they know you. And it, let's say you're a student and you're targeting other students. They'll go, well, this is obviously a student-made app. It feels weird, right? It doesn't feel right. And errors are a way that just makes the app just feel, ugh, like you just don't want to use it, right? Um, so really try to hide that unless it's absolutely necessary to show the user. Have lots of safety nets in your, in your back end. Uh, you should be trying to obviously recover anything you possibly can, um, but you should, if there's like an event that has to be triggered and for some reason like your notification pusher service is not sending out a notification, save that data in the database and recover it later. Uh, have safety nets everywhere and load balance and distribute as much as you possibly can without it becoming a hassle. So reduce your own single points of failure with your software by load balancing your front ends, your back ends, and making it so that if like one server dies or something, or one VM, it doesn't take down your entire app. Uh, this is super important. You should be building with the ability to scale, not for scale. And this is something that a lot of people mess up. Uh, especially engineers. They spend a lot of time scaling when they're not supposed to. Um, so you should be asking yourself, what is not going to scale well? What's the backup plan for that? If you have something like an SQL database, SQL databases are notoriously difficult to scale horizontally, which means across multiple machines. 
you can go and you know add more RAM, add more CPU cores um, to a singular server, and that will beef up the the, uh, the database. But it's very difficult to do it across two different machines. You start getting into replication, and it gets very, very complicated. Um, so you should be picking technologies that can scale, and there's options for databases. Up to you to decide uh, what makes sense for your app. Uh, but you should have the thought of scale in your mind when you're picking your technologies. Do not optimize for scale before it's needed. Stay small and as lean, uh, small and lean for as long as you possibly can. And this is really big because a lot of engineers will go and they'll build a product and they will build it for a million users and they'll go and they'll get 10. And they wasted all their time building a product that can scale to a million people and all that, all that product will ever have is 10, 10 users. Don't be those engineers. It's very easy to fall into it because it's exciting, it's fun to build for scale, but it's just, you're wasting your time. Don't do it. Make sure your technologies can take advantage of auto load balancing and auto scaling tools. This is very important, especially in something like AWS. Uh, they have great load balancing and scaling uh, tools that are all automatic. You don't even have to think about it. But you need to make sure that your technologies can take advantage of that. So something like databases, like I said, probably can't really do that. So you have to think about that prior to uh, building your app. So now let's talk about components of a consumer social app. So first you have the friend and social graphs. Uh, so this is basically who knows who, what connections uh, can we suggest, who invited who, and uh, who has influence over other people in their circle. And this is really, really important and is gonna be an integral part of your app. Um, all your interactions should be dumped there. So if somebody shared a post with somebody else, somebody booked for something, somebody commented, liked a post, this should go in there and this is gonna tell you a lot of information about their relationship. Um, basically, social graphs are used in all social media apps. It is one of the most prevalent technologies in consumer social, period. Uh, and it's, it is an absolute must in my opinion. The key with uh, friend and social graphs is that clean data uh, is extremely, extremely important. Since every decision you make in your recommendation system, your timelines, who you suggest, searches, it all flows downward, uh, downstream from your friend and social graph. So you have to make sure that everything in here is rock, rock solid. Now you have recommend, recommender systems. Uh, so this is basically recommending things to your users, whether it be friends, posts, messages, content, gamification steps, or whatever comes next in your app. Um, Recommendation systems should be highly, highly tunable so that you're able to experiment and test and see how values uh, change for users based off of some parameters that you set, um, based off of like the heuristics that you collect from the, uh, the app, app usage itself, or from the friend and social graph. Uh, recommend recommendation systems should be tuned for accuracy and speed. Uh, so you don't want to be showing videos of dogs to people that like cats. And likewise, you don't want somebody to go and have their recommendations for their timeline take three seconds to load. You're gonna be losing those people uh, on your app. Uh, analytics are heuristics for this, and we're gonna talk about analytics in a little bit. The analytics are super, super important and should feed into your social graph, uh, into your recommendation system and your social graph um, to basically come up with what you're gonna be recommending to the next, uh, to the user next, like what post or whatever. Uh, and this is something else. This is, most recommendation systems now are made with machine learning. And machine learning is dope. It's very, very cool. Um, but when you're first launching, you probably don't need it. You probably don't have enough data to build a good model. So forget it. Um, don't over-engineer it. Lots of engineers before you have built recommendation systems using hard code do the same. It's not worth the expense, the time, building a machine learning model in the beginning. Then of course you have messaging. Um, so there's different kinds of messaging. There's real-time private messages between two people, real-time group chats, uh, asynchronous messaging. Asynchronous messaging would be like Snapchat where you would send a, a message and it's not necessarily um, being read and received at the same time. Um, but you should ask yourself, maybe messaging outside of the app is best. And uh, the reason it could be really good is because it kind of facilitates that word of mouth and forces people to send to their friends outside of the app uh, and maybe gets people questioning, hey, where did that post come from? What, what's that from? 
and maybe getting people on your app. Um, you should decide what is needed with messaging uh, because complexity is very bad and messaging can very quickly get very complicated. Like if you decide that your app wants, uh, needs encryption all of a sudden, that gets very complicated to uh, integrate. It gets very costly and uh, per big performance uh, issues that come with that. So you need, on, you need to decide what is actually needed for your app to function and build based off of that. Then we have timelines. Timelines are in everything pretty much nowadays. Uh, timelines are based on your recommendation system or they can be chronological. Most apps let you switch now. Um, timelines can be very complicated. There's basically two philosophies. Either you generate uh, your timeline on read or write, and uh, there's a whole bunch of engineering blogs on Facebook and, and Twitter um, from years ago that talk about how difficult this is to do and facilitate. But basically the idea is, is that when somebody makes a post, do you write that post to that user's database table uh, for their timeline and then they just read it? Or when the user comes and visits and tries to fetch their uh, timeline from your back end, do you construct the timeline in real time like that? There's a whole bunch of scale and uh, scale, time, and performance implications that come with that. Uh, so it's really worth looking into and deciding is it worth uh, investing some different technology into that, uh, even putting timelines in your app uh, altogether. Then you have searching. Uh, so searching is, you know, some of you type in like John and it pops up all the Johns that you know or may know or something like that. Uh, so searching basically involves adding technologies that in de index all of your users' posts, uh, your users themselves, or any other information that might be relevant, and the relationship to that user in the social graph. A uh, small recommendation system is important to have in a search component uh, so that everything stays relevant to the user, right? Like if you type in Carla, you want Carlas that are relevant to the user. You don't want Carlas that are in another state halfway across the, the world or something like that. Um, searching, of course, adds more data, which means more indexes and more complexity. Um, so the more indexes you have, it's more storage. It's just very, very complicated to do a good search system. And there's other technologies you probably have to add to make it uh, worthwhile. This is the most important part. Sign up flow, OAuth, and OTP. OTP is one-time passcode. Um, this, is, this is where you should be spending most of your time and most of your energy in the beginning of your app until you have this flow kind of set and running really, really well. Um, the thing I can tell you right now is simplicity sells. Leverage existing and familiar services. We talked about this already. If you can have OAuth, so like sign in with, with Google, sign in with Facebook, sign in with Instagram, sign in with Apple, put that button there. If it works for your app, add that button. That's fine. Uh, reduce the amount of screens and keep authentication super, super simple. Don't be asking for passwords. Don't be asking for first name and last name. If you can avoid it, get that data from somewhere else. If you can make use of one-time passcodes, do that too. Um, automate as much as you possibly can. Autofill in details if you can. So if you know an invite's coming from somebody, uh, like person A sends an invite to person B, and person B's name and person A's phone is whatever, like some nickname or something, fill that nickname in for them automatically. Attach that data to the share uh, token. Uh, similarly, if you are signing in with like uh, Google or something like that, capture the first name and last name from the sign in button, fill it in automatically. Or get rid of first name and last name altogether if it doesn't even matter for your app. Uh, social proofing works really, really good. TikTok does a fantastic job of this. If you've ever opened a TikTok uh, on your phone and you don't have TikTok on it, You'll see at the top, it'll say the person's name and their photo, and it says, uh, you know, like Carla is on TikTok, you should be there too. Um, so it's super, super good, and it reminds them, become one with the crowd, do not be different, right? And it all ties back into everything we talked about before. Uh, then we have posting. So posting is self-explanatory, lots of apps have it. Uh, how do we deal with posting? Is it into groups? Is it into group chats? Is it public? You have to ask yourself that. Um, one of the biggest complications, of course, is that private groups make apps look dead. And I'll give you a great example with Discord. If you were to join Discord and you didn't already have a community to join, you would load up and it would be empty and you would have nothing to look at. And that makes the app feel dead and you're less likely to be coming back. So how can I make it feel alive? Where's the fear of missing out? In something like Discord, 
you have to have a community kind of already there and you have a reason why you want to join. Maybe your friends are there, uh, maybe there's a subreddit that has a Discord page or something like that. Um, but in your app, you probably don't have that luxury uh, as being as synonymous as Discord. So how can you encourage people to post? How can you make sure that those posts are seen by other people? And how can I make the app actually feel like it's alive, right? Uh, so you could do lots of animations, special interactions. Of course, you can have public profiles and timelines. That is really important. Now you have real-time syncing. This is a whole rabbit hole that you can kind of fall down into. Um, but real-time syncing is basically, if you ever seen it on Twitter, Flash X, uh, you load up the timeline and the like count kind of goes up and maybe the comments go up while you're looking at it. Uh, this obviously makes the app feel alive, right? But it comes at the cost of complexity. Now you have a whole other system you have to manage with web sockets and, or maybe HTTP polling. It gets very complicated. Um, of course, the other issue is um, if you have this system that makes it feel like people are using the app right now because you see that animation ticking up and that count going up, the flip side is if that count is not going up and they're expecting it to, the app now feels dead, right? So kind of you have that same thing where it can feel very alive, but the very reason it feels alive is the same reason why it could feel very dead. And that is really, really bad. Um, you obviously, complexity-wise in terms of technology, you're now increasing the request load that your backend has to take. So you might have to scale a little bit differently. You might have to uh, change how your databases work. Uh, there's other things that you have to take into account when you do something like that. Live streaming. Live streaming is popular at the end of apps life cycles or somewhere around the middle. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because live streaming is very expensive. And the perfect example of this is that Twitch has never returned a profit. And that's, it's because it's incredibly expensive to push uh, video packets and audio packets through the internet to a bunch of different people. So the bandwidth cost is immense. Um, the, of course, the good thing about live streaming is it makes your app feel very alive and present, but it's at the cost of money. Uh, it's a very, very big money sink, so make sure that if you have live streaming, it's some novel product and there's a really good reason why you have it and it's worth it. Similarly, posting and hosting uh, photo and video is also very complex in terms of like how you actually structure the data on hard drives, if you do compression, things like that. Um, but there's also bandwidth costs with that as well. It's not nearly as large as live streaming, but it is very large. Um, there's basically three factors that go into posting and hosting photo video uh, properly. It's storing it properly, serving it well, and paying for bandwidth. Uh, so storage is not just adding more hard drives to your system. Storage is, uh, it's much more complex. It's understanding like what content needs to be served very quickly, what can be a little bit slower, uh, and what can be put into like kind of a cold back vault sort of. Um, so this comes at the, uh, at the cost of SSDs and RAM caches, which are very expensive. And um, by dealing with all that, that means that the cost per uh, gigabyte that you store has just gone through the roof. And um, when it goes through the roof, that means you're spending a lot of money. So it might be cheaper than live streaming, but it's still a very big money sink. Then you have analytics. And uh, analytics are basically how you can be collecting your uh, key performance indicators, uh, service and performance metrics, other heuristics for your recommendation system as you see fit. You need to nail this down. You need to make it resilient. Analytics is one of those things that is going to continue with you and be a massive part of every app you make. So really just make it solid from the very beginning. Uh, much of this data is going to be the sole determining factor for decisions you make somewhere down the line. So you really want to make sure that this data is clean, accurate, and concise. Um, build it once, build it right, like I said, or pay for a service. Uh, but it's very important that if you are intending to pay for a service to do analytics, you understand that this is one of the places where providers will try to take advantage of you. So have backup plans, have some other system. If you can build it on your own in a way that makes sense and is not going to take a lot of time, you can do that as well. That's fine. Safety. Uh, safety is pretty much the last one, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but safety is incredibly, incredibly important. And it's often overlooked, but it can't be. And it's for one simple reason. Apple and Google will decline your app if you do not have good safety policies on your app. 
So that means that you need to have content moderation plans. So if you have user-generated content being added to your platform, you need to have a way of uh, moderating that. And if it gets reported, handling it, how are you gonna handle it? You need to have something that at least appeases Apple, um, but you should really have one that makes your app enjoyable as well. Because if you have a bunch of terrible content being posted, nobody wants to keep coming back to a place that makes them feel terrible. So maybe in the beginning you have humans overlooking your reports, and that's fine at the beginning, but how is that gonna scale? You have to make sure that you answer that question for yourself. Um, reporting and banning users is also a requirement of apps. It's also just a good, a good thing to have in an app anyway, uh, because if there's person A doesn't wanna see person B, and they ban them or they, they just block them, that's incredibly, incredibly important, I think. Uh, and it makes their time on the app a lot more enjoyable if they don't wanna see that person. So just build that in your recommendation and social graphs anyway. So after all that, now it's time to launch. And this is really simple. It basically boils down to a few main things. You need to specify your geographic area or your community. This is that niche market that you're planning to saturate. Uh, keep your eye on the metrics. So you need to remember all those things that we talked about, user growth rate, retention rate, et cetera. Uh, you need to keep your eye on that. And you need to understand when the app is working and when it's not. Uh, and extending from that, you need to understand when it's time to shut down and try again in another geographic area or another community. Just because you make an app that doesn't work out in one specific area it doesn't mean that you or the app is a failure. You might just have to make a couple of changes, uh, maybe change the, the market you're going after, demographic. Um, but you have to make sure that you understand when it's time to shut down and you actually do that. You don't just keep running along on one app because you think it's gonna work. If you don't have explosive growth in the beginning, you're not gonna get it later. Um, you should be identifying what is working, what isn't, and iterate on that. So if you are closing your app in one area, you need to understand what ended up working, what stopped working, all that, and you need to um, take those individual components or ph philosophies and iterate on that. And keep trying, try, try again. Okay, now let's talk about scaling. Now, the first thing you have to do when you're talking about scaling is ask yourself, do I have to scale? Do you really have to do this? Because scale is complex. It adds a lot of unnecessary work sometimes if it's not needed. Uh, and this means that there's a lot more complications when you're building your app. So you have to ask yourself, what metrics are telling me that it's time to scale my app? Is there another reason why those metrics could be returning those values? Is there something else that could be done to maybe fix that? Uh, is there a simpler change that you can make that addresses those seemingly scaling uh, falls, uh, pitfalls? If you answer no, uh, and you think you need to scale, now you have to ask yourself what needs to scale. Uh, so you have to identify the components that need to scale and why they have to scale. Is it a database? Uh, if it's a database, maybe it's not a scale issue with the databases. Maybe you have to optimize your SQL queries maybe rewrite them, maybe you have to build indexes or something. Uh, so you should be asking these questions to avoid having to scale out uh, your databases. Likewise with servers. Is it your servers that are not able to handle the request per second or is it your code? Do you have to optimize your code? Should you be swapping frameworks? That's for you to decide, but you should be asking yourself these questions. Um, and finally, the penultimate uh, question that you should be asking yourself after all this is, is it worth the time optimizing those SQL queries, your code, swapping up frameworks, whatever, versus just spending time on other parts of the business and just letting the auto scalers do their thing? That's a decision that you have to make and it's up to you and your company and your, uh, your founders to decide if it's worth spending the extra time doing that. You have to figure out what is going to tank your business. So there's certain things that are gonna absolutely just tank your business and drive all the money out of it. And one of those things is bandwidth, uh, which is a massive cost. So you have to ask yourself, why are you using so much bandwidth? Is it worth it? Is the thing that you're doing worth the cost that's related to it? Um, and if you decide that the answer is yes and you're willing to take the cost for the bandwidth, you have to ask yourself, if this goes cosmic, starts going super, super high up, you get a bunch of users, it's explosive growth. Do you have an exit strategy when it becomes too expensive? Are you looking to be acquired? Are you trying to sell to somebody? Are you gonna look for investors? 
Do you have things lined up? Because the last thing you want to do is go into like crippling debt because you thought something was going to work, you didn't have a way out, and now you have all these bills you have to pay. The last thing is feedback. And feedback is kind of complicated when it comes to consumer social apps. Uh, and that's for a number of reasons. Uh, it feels really bad. Um, and the reason for that is that it's actual people with actual names, and you might even know these people. These might be people that you recognize from somebody in your chemistry class, or somebody you know, or something like that. Um, that gets very hard to see, right? You see somebody criticizing you and somebody that you know, and it's a face that you recognize. That hurts. Um, but you have to understand that it's a little more complicated than that, right? Because to them, you are an entity. Uh, unless you explicitly told them that you made that app, uh, and in that case, they're probably not leaving you negative comments anyway, you are just the app. You're not a person to them, right? They're leaving feedback on the app. And uh, you have to kind of separate that and understand that there is that division point in their mind. Um, one of the other things you have to do, uh, you have to understand, is that a lot of people that leave feedback on apps, it tends to be negative. They're more likely to leave feedback uh, if it's negative feedback that they're going to leave. So you might have a lot more happy customers than you do negative, but you're only going to be reading the negative. Uh, and from that, it's important to then actually sort through all those negative comments and look for the constructive ones versus the bad ones. Um, and this could be difficult because the bad ones can hurt and they can sting, uh, but you got to go through it and you have to find the constructive ones. And you have to find the ones that are talking about performance, bug fixes, something like that that you actually have to act on. Uh, something else you have to keep in mind is consumers don't actually know what they want. They might tell you they know what they want, they might tell you exactly what they want. They do not want that. You need to make sure that you always have a vision for where you are going, where you are heading. And you have to. Um, you need to basically stay true to that as much as you can and don't listen to the consumers, don't listen to the people using your apps. Rumors can start if you become big enough. It's perfectly normal. Rumors start naturally, they also start through competition. If you have competitors, they might try to start a rumor to make your app get dragged or something online. This is fine, it's normal. You need to just understand that these things happen and uh, you just address what you have to, forget about everything else. Uh, and most importantly, stay cool, calm, and collected. So my final question after all this is, uh, we've been through it all. I mean, it's been over an hour, right? It's a long, long time. I gave you all this information. Are you sure you want to do this? Like, I'm telling you right now, if you go and build a B2B app, you go solve a problem for a business, they are going to hand you checks for $10,000. $10,000 you can deposit in your account today. Are you really, really sure that you want to do this? Are you? After all this, if you're saying yes, I have one final question. Really? Why? Like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Anyway, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And obviously, I'm kidding. I love consumer social as much as you guys probably do. Um, so I get it. It's the bug. I understand. Uh, that's me. Thank you very much, everyone.